Welcome to Writer's Den. I'm Brenda Joyce Patterson. Writer's Den is a show that showcases and uncovers writers and all things literary in Polk County and beyond. Today we're at um, Lakeland's gorgeous Terrace Hotel and I get the sincere pleasure of talking with author Jamie Ford today. Thank you. Thanks and for welcome. having me. Yeah, it's ah, great to be here. Oh, Love you're it. welcome. You're welcome. Um, as I mentioned before, um, it's a fangirl moment. <laughs> I love all of this uh, opportunity, all these opportunities to talk to writers, yeah. kind of dig around in their psyche and find out what's going on. So, I'm, I'm the same way. I want your job sometimes, you know. Oh, really? Yeah, I want to sit down with my favorite authors and be like, okay, what's the real story behind that? You know. Yeah, I'm, I know I'm very fortunate for this. Um, so, Jamie Ford, we have you here today. You are the proud author of three <laughs> novels. Yeah, how Three. that happened? Oh Crazy. my God, it's no. like really exciting. So it's Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, um, Songs of Willow Frost, yep. and the one I'm in the middle of, Love and Other Consolation Prizes. Indeed. Yeah, and um, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump <laughs> in with this part. You're doing fantastic things with Hotel and on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, yes? <laughs> yeah. I, exciting. I, I, Thanks. Yeah, you know, my, my agent just uh, was texting her. She just reprimanded me because I wasn't keeping her in the loop. Uh -oh. <laughs> just, I thought I had given her the update. Oh. So yeah, in October, there's a developmental performance in New York City of a hotel musical. And cool. then the, I don't, I don't think we can call it pre-production. We're sort of in pre-pre-production of the oh, okay. film. The, the film's been optioned by some terrific producers. They brought in George Takei as an executive producer. Um, they brought in some very interesting people in uh, the business community. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll see what happens. I'm just crossing my fingers. Um, <laughs> Hollywood great. is really strange. There's so many moving pieces and I only understand some of them. <laughs> There's other stuff going on. I'm like, I, I think this is, this is happening. We'll, we'll see what happens. Ah, um, that's sort of like the writer's dream, isn't it? Um, you you sit in your little yeah. your little writer's garret and you write something. You make up all of these things, and then eventually it shows up as movies, as musicals, as plays. It's a it's a weird. Yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, I never wrote the book thinking like. No. This is going to be a movie, or right. it's like like the book was the number one book in Norway. And I never wrote thinking, this is gonna rock Oslo. You know, I just don't. Is I just, it really? Yeah, I just, I just wrote, that's I just so wanted cool. to please one person out there that's not related to me. You know, my, my bar for success was really low. And so everything else <laughs> yes. is just kind of a bonus. The movie yeah. stuff, I'm a little, um, it's, it's definitely kind of a wait and see because a lot of books to film, they can be in pre-production for 20 years. Yes. But. This all signs point to yes on this one. So oh. there's a lot of stuff I, I probably shouldn't say. No, no, no. We but, won't uh, ask, but we'll I, just be excited yeah, in the corner for you. Yeah, yes. there's stuff happening that's pretty exciting. All right. Man, I, I like that line you said about um, you wanted to um, please at least one person that's <laughs> yeah. not um, uh, related yeah. to you. I yeah. feel you on that. I really do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I tend to write. Um, I, I love uh, the late Harlan Ellison where he said, you mm. should write for the wisest, wittiest, most intelligent audience in the universe. Write for yourself. Oh, and okay. So, that sounds like him, yeah. A, a lot of times <laughs> I just write for myself and then if someone else enjoys it, that's a bonus. Mm. I would agree with that. Um, not that I'm anywhere near you, <laughs> but I would agree with that. Um, we talked about a lot of things um, yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and in case you're wondering how it is that I keep talking to these people and saying, we talked yesterday, <laughs> is because um, oftentimes they're going to appear at the Lakeland Public Library, as the, is the case mm -hmm. with Jamie Ford today. And so we talked and I did my research. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. beforehand. So um, we talked about a lot of things yesterday. Um, and one thing that I really like, and I think I probably said it with a little too much like excitement and glee, was that um, you are a writer, a man, who says he likes romance. <laughs> I, I have to keep repeating that because yeah. um, oftentimes uh, men in general and certainly uh, male writers, they're like, 
no, no romance for me. No, we're killing people, you know. Yeah. And so I'd like to, to hear more of that if you don't mind. Yeah, um, because my first book is read a lot in schools now. Um, oh. Colleges, um, some middle schools, but a lot of high schools. I visit a lot of high schools and I go and give talks mm -hmm. and I talk about love stories. And I can see the audience. I see the young women are like, oh, love stories. And I see the dudes that are just like, oh no, please. We're yes. not going there, are we? Right, you know? right, and, right. And, and I get that. But, um, I just, I've always had a deep abiding weakness for love stories. I, that's, it's something that I look back on it and it, you know, it's, it's not an asset being a very sensitive dude in high school. You know, that's, that's not like, you know, that's, that's not, uh, seen as a strength, but as right. a writer, it's like my superpower now. So, just uh, the world's the world's made better by late bloomers. You could be a late bloomer too. <laughs> I like that. I like that. The world is made better. So, when you say late bloomer, what do you yeah. mean? Well, I, I think. I mean, uh, are you talking about late bloomer in like high school kind of late bloomer? Or are you talking about late bloomer as in writer? Really for, really for both. I mean, sp specifically for writers, mm -hmm. I think I meet a lot of very young writers who are fresh out of school, all the talent in the world, but they can't get it done because they just haven't had their hearts broken enough. You know what I mean? They gotta uh -huh. be kicked around by life a little bit wow. if you're gonna tell an emotional story. That's not to say, you know, don't run out in traffic and lay down and, and no. you know, subject yourself to uh, abuse or right. uh, something like that. Just for your art. You don't, yeah, you don't you want don't to, to put yeah, yourself... Don't go in search of suffering. Right. But right. over the course of life, you're going you're gonna to dig a deeper emotional well. And I think that benefits you later in life. In high school, I think we're all... You know, no one wants to peak in high school. Um, that's, no. that's a tragedy right there. No, your best time is yeah. when you're in high school. You don't no. want to be like Uncle Rico at 50 going... Remember when we made state, you know, oh, you know, dude. you, you got to move on with your life. I know people who do that. I've, or I should say I've talked to people who do that and that sounds bad. Yeah, yeah but I get it. Yeah. That'll be, that'll be me in 40 years. Remember my first book? Oh, but you'll be able to say that though. <laughs> yeah. That would be fantastic. I'd love to be able to say that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I saw the interviews with you, other interviews with you oh, okay. and, um, when you said that about um, romance and um, and especially that part there about getting beat up a little bit about by life, I thought my first thought was what, and then my second thought was yes, you're right because oftentimes um, to tell a story that's nuanced, whether it's a relationship story or whether it's whether it's even a spy story, if you don't have a little bit of uh, life experience behind you. Yeah. How can you make your characters deep and um, and real? Right, right. Yeah. I, I just, I do think, well, Pat Conroy is a writer that I, I yes. loved and admired. Yes. He said the greatest gift a writer can ever be given is an unhappy childhood. Oh, jeez. Unfortunately for Pat, it was Christmas every day in the Conroy household. Yeah. And so I don't wish that on anybody, but a lot of times I feel like the things that, that we carry around our scars, those, those actually activate later in life. And for a creative person, that, that makes you better. Mm -hmm. It gives you a perspective that you, you can't, uh, it's hard to replicate on the page unless you've experienced a little bit of loss or grief or love or turmoil. Um, you know, I think yeah. we're born to live lives of inconsistency. And, and if you're at 18, 19, you just haven't lived much of a life. Your inconsistency has been like, oh, I was late to meet my friends at, you know, the mall. Mm. Or I was on Twitch and, you know, mm. got kicked off or something like that. That's not, that doesn't, that's not stuff that feeds uh, a future creative life. You have mm. to earn those things a little later, I think. I would agree with that. Though, um, I will say that um, having empathy, being an empathetic person, yeah. uh, can sort of be a shortcut. <laughs> shortcut in in the way that yeah. you don't you may not necessarily have to have that that beating up of life yeah. but you you are able to um, to recognize and identify with others who've had that right. but there's a certain amount of seasoning no matter what that um, a writer will need I think in order to um, to do and, good and, work and I'm, I'm talking about like uh, I mean it's I may be being a little 
too much when I say scars and things like that. Sometimes oh, yeah. it's just life experience. And I think mm -hmm. you could go to an MFA program and that's great. Or you could just go hang out at the track and look at people, go hang out at a bus station and observe people. That's true. Put yourself in situations that that you're not familiar with, go to the neighborhoods and the restaurants and the festivals of places that you don't normally go and experience those things. And I think mm -hmm. that can enrich you as a writer as well. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I'm glad that you mentioned about um, MFAs. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> we were talking about <laughs> yeah. um, um, education and what have you. And yeah. you said something. I know you probably hate this when you no. have conversations and then the person brings it up no, later. No, no, it's uh -huh. okay. But you said something that was a little bit, um, well, a little bit shocking. Because <laughs> <laughs> you said that you kind of suggested to your son, who just recently um, oh, graduated yeah. from college, that maybe he didn't need college. Yeah. Yeah, tell us just a teeny bit about that. I don't mean to get very yeah, much no. into your, your home life, but I thought it was interesting <laughs> yeah. because I, I make my living in the arts and mm. um, I'm for better or worse I'm a self-taught writer and this is good. and my son's a musician mm -hmm. and most if not I don't know what the percentage is but I'd say 60 70 percent of the working musicians in the world are they don't have a MFA in right. music right and so when Taylor um, was getting of college age, I, I encouraged him just to go to Nashville for a year, go to Europe right. and busk it in subway terminals. Yeah. Again, get that life experience, be a right. bit of a troubadour. Right. And doggone it, my kid insisted on going to college and getting a double major in performance and <laughs> composition. Well, she showed me. Well, somebody had to be the adult yeah. here, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but truth be told, when he was, yeah. he was 13, I think, when I got him his first guitar, which he wanted, oh. um, and, and he and he still has it. Mm -hmm. um, I did. I told him I'm like, some dads want their kids to be doctors and lawyers and accountants. Right. I want you to save rock and roll. Oh. And that was, and he took me seriously. <laughs> oh, cool. So he's out there fighting a the good fight. Oh. Although That's I don't wonderful. Know, I don't know what she would, his music, I don't, it's, he, he plays a lot of math rock, so it's not exactly the... What in the world is math rock? Oh boy, I know, I had to... You threw it we're, out we're there. We're both showing our ages here, you know, <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry. If you ask someone that's like in their 30s, like, oh yeah, math rock, I get that. Yeah, no, yeah. throw out a couple of bands. Okay, um, yes, I am over 50, I'm sorry. It's, <laughs> uh, I guess, post-hardcore music that has some jazz roots, oh. and the music has a lot of unusual time signatures oh, going okay. back and forth. Um, okay, I get that. Yeah, so it's... A lot of improvisation in there-ish? Yeah, I... An element? Because when you say jazz, that's I, what I think. Yeah, I, I would say probably not performance to performance, but in the original composition, uh -huh. it's, it's pretty unique stuff. Hmm. Um, it's like, in like jazz, the people who I think really are into jazz are other musicians because they appreciate how hard it is. Yes. And I think with math rock, a lot of their fans are other musicians as well because uh. they were like, oh, I know what you're doing. That's okay. complicated. Props, yeah. You know. Yeah, I could see that. So we'll see. I could see that. My husband would probably be like, yes. Of course, math rock, because he likes jazz and he's a musician. Yeah. He plays the drums, and so he's really right. good. Yeah. Um, but, but he also plays, I mean, creates other stuff. So I write to a lot of his music these days because he, he, yeah, he produces a lot of lo fi hip hop, which you can go yeah. onto like Spotify or something, and there'll be channels just called like, yes. homework. <laughs> you know, yes, it's, I've it's seen that. Cool ambient music you can get worked on too. Right. Hmm. Okay. Well, that's good. Uh, MFA, again, I'm going to go oh, yeah, yeah. back to that. Um, so, you're a self-taught writer. You wouldn't think... Uh, just tell me your stance on MFAs for writers. Is it a good thing, bad thing? I, I have pretty strong opinions on MFAs. And <laughs> to qualify this, I, I walked out of the SAT. So uh, I have a very unique uh, okay. take on formal okay. education, All right. which is funny because then I was later asked to give a talk on the campus of where they create the SAT, which is near Princeton. Interesting. And they asked okay. me what I got, and I said I walked out, and they're like, well, you got a, I think I got a 400 for signing my name. I think that's what you get. Do you really? Yeah. I didn't know that. And I didn't mm. even want that. So anyway, mm. um, MFAs, they're too expensive. 
Yes, um, they are. If, if, you, if you need it to teach, I get it. If you need it to apply for certain grants and fellowships, I get it. Mm -hmm. If you need it to be a writer, it's a, it's a maybe. If, if you can afford 60 grand or whatever it is right. these days, cool. But mm -hmm. I, I, I just think it's not worth the money. Okay. I think for far less than that, you could travel, get a little life experience. You could, mm -hmm. if you're going to go 60 grand in debt, you could go 60 grand in debt and just take a couple years off and just write if you could well, sure. live economically. Right. Um, and it, there's a, there's a, I can look at certain writers and I can, they, they have, their work has a sort of processed feel to yes. it and it's polished. Yes, but it was I know created what you mean. in such a critical environment that those writers, in my opinion, come out and they're performance writers where they're writing for other writers. Hmm. I and, would agree with and that. And it takes a while for them to get away from that and find their own voice, just like my son as a musician. It's going to take a while for him to find his own voice. Mm -hmm. And it's an expensive uh, gate to pass through to get there. And I think you can get there without it. Yeah. You could go to writing conferences and get that kind of tough love criticism right. it, that you need for far less yes. than an MFA. Not that you need me to agree with you, but I do agree with you. Um, um, I do have, uh, I have some degrees. I have three degrees, um, not in writing. Sure. Um, and I do like the idea of getting an education, but all of the writing that I've done um, and the writing that I do now has taken place without me having a lot of formal education in writing. I mean, I think the best education in writing is reading. First. I think that's a big part of it. First and foremost. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, seeing what people are doing um, and sort of learn technique and craft through osmosis in a way. Yeah. And then when you're in, mm. in the trenches and you're really working, like you say, that's when you go to workshops and conferences and uh, what have you. I think one of the most important parts of an MFA um, is that kind of socialization that you get a chance to be yeah, for sure. a, sort of like in the cooker with other yeah. writers. But personally, I'd prefer to do it at a workshop or a conference. The, the socialization yeah. can work two ways. It can work great and it, you sort of find your tribe of weird writerly people. Right. But in some environments, it's super clicky. And True. if, and, and we can all win as writers. I, yes. I really think that, but there, there is a segment of the writing population that it is a, if you win, I lose. And it's people that are, they're, they're aspiring to certain literary awards and it's, it's hyper competitive. True. And it's kind of that Brooklyn vibe that mm. I find kind of humorous because I'm a West Coast kid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly, um, I'm down here in Florida. Um, I'm part of no coast in a way because uh, Florida is always... You're in your own country down I here just, in Florida. I was just going to say Florida. Yeah. I know that they talk about Texas being its own little country, but I think that Florida is in many ways its own like I don't know dimension. Its own not, universe down here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, not just country, but its own dimension. Um, but yes, the, that whole click thing is something that's sort of problematic, and I think that writing groups would help with that um, lo on a local yeah. way, so that you could find find and or make your own writing tribe. Yeah, you, yeah. you saw me sort of like wince when I when, you, when I said writing groups again. Yeah. That's that's hit and miss, and you have uh, to be yes. unless they're going to be honest with you, that's and, true. and not mean, but they have to be honest. And right. I've been starting out. I was a part of a writing group, and everyone was just too nice. They just uh, yes. no one ever got better because everyone just sort of pat each other on the back collectively. Right. Nice people, um, but it didn't it didn't advance the cause. Mm. What what I Instead of an MFA, because I, I don't have a, even a bachelor's, mm -hmm. and I was thinking about going to school, um, an author friend said, before you go to school, go to a garage sale and buy three of the worst out-of-print books you could find, spend no more than a quarter for each book, and then mm -hmm. force yourself to read them with a, as a writer and pick apart what's happening on the page, what's wrong, the yes. lazy writing, the mm -hmm. lapse in perspective, the... Mm -hmm. uh, you know how the story is told and when you go back to your own work you will catch yourself making those mistakes yes and it's true 
I, I always tell people, when you're, if you want to write, stop reading your favorite authors. Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of like going to the gym and then reading Vogue magazine. You're going you're gonna to die a death of comparison. You know? <laughs> and mm. it's not to say that you should just only look at the worst stuff possible. I'm not saying that. But just as an exercise, it's a very unique exercise. And for me, it was very useful. Hmm. And I still have those books. Ah, I'm not going to ask you the titles. <laughs> that would be hard. print. That would be yeah. horrible. And someone paid good money for them. Once well, upon a of time. course, of course. I mean, and they paid to print them. Blah blah. Right. So I understand. Yeah. I understand. So I'm not going to put those poor writers <laughs> <laughs> up there. You know, for people to go, ooh, well, Jamie Ford said you're crap. Yeah. yeah oh, they, no, they wouldn't be anything anybody would recognize. Okay. I mean, these are well, books like good. from the early '60s. That ah. I found. Yeah. Okay. But, All right. Um, you mentioned just now about um, having the whole thing of um, that 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 school of thought, whereas if you win, that means I oh, lose, yeah, yeah. and um, vice versa. Um, I'm just going to jump in. So, do you think it has that whole thing has to do with um, with race and gender and? Privilege and what have you. I'm just going to jump deeper. right in there. Yeah. It has to deal with capitalism. Ah. I mean, capitalism really tells us you can't like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter because financially, you may only be able to buy one set of DVDs. Mm. And granted, you can go to the library. You can get them all at the library. Please um, go to the library. But, but yes. it forces us as a culture to choose one is better than the other because that's worth my money. That's worth my attention. Ah. And I think in a capitalist society, it's there's always expected to be a loser if there's a winner. And it's not always the case. I think we're a country of 300 million people. Right. There are enough books for all of us, and we all have diverse reading tastes. Well, right. And I think as a whole, if I publish a book and my friend publishes a book, and we're on the shelves together, we're like high-fiving. We're like, yeah. Yeah. We're not thinking, oh, well, if Hillary Jordan sells a bunch of books, they're not going to buy mine. Right. There's, there's enough readers to go around. But when it comes to sort of elite level literary awards, mm -hmm. there can only be There can only be one. one. There can be only one. <laughs> and right. then people, performance writers, they often don't sell many books unless they have that stamp of approval. That's true. Uh, all of Kitteridge, which won the Pulitzer, sold like 3,000 copies until she won the Pulitzer, then it sold, you know, 500,000. But it was a really good book. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but yes, a lot of really the, good books. The kinds, get, the, the topic, may not be the popular thing or whatever. But, but for her, like there were a lot of people that year just hoping to win that award because they true. needed that so they could quit their job teaching yeah. or that they could you know, um, stop uh, applying for grants and fellowships that could actually make a living at their craft. And when you forget that there's readers out there in addition to critics, then true. you sort of you become a performative writer and you, your audience is very small. Mm. Yeah. I, know. I have weird opinions on this. No, 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 no. It, it's something to think about. And you're right, I think, about the sort of competitive nature of things, especially, I was going to say especially in writing, but that's not true. Especially in the arts, because the arts are already um, smushed into a little area. Um, and then you have to sort of, there can only be one in right. that smaller area. It makes things a lot more um, sort of rarefied. Um, yeah, I, I crashed the Brooklyn, the, there was like a gala party for the, Br the Brooklyn uh, Book Festival. Okay. And uh, I was in Brooklyn for uh, musical things mm -hmm. in New York. And a friend was at this party like, come on over, just crash it. So we crashed it. And the National Book Awards had just come out. And there was just this vibe in the room of like, well, so-and-so really shouldn't didn't deserve that or why didn't this one and, and mm -hmm. it was just sort of like henpecking of each other that Man. I just don't have any interest in participating right. in. I'm more concerned that James Patterson puts out 900 books a year and doesn't write any of them. And I think that's a bigger, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a that's bigger disgrace than so and so got passed up for an award. So. Right. Yeah. I, we've done all this talking and I hadn't had a chance to ask you about, I don't know, diversity things and oh, what have yeah. you. but. Don't hate me. Yeah. We're sort of out of time-ish. Yeah. Um, let me think. So is this it, is an important thing, though. Yeah, it's a question Bec about writers, diverse writers, voices, uh, sensitivity readers, it. staying in your own lane, all those kind of things. Go, go with that. Okay. Go with that. I have, I have a different, I have a contrary opinion here. Okay, please. And, and I think the publishing world 
would like us all to stay in our own lanes because it's safe. So if this person writes about their experience, then this person who represents that experience isn't going to um, be less critical of them. Right. Um, less the concept of appropriation. Mm. Um, there, there's an asterisk to what I'm saying, and I'll get to the asterisk. Okay. But I, I really feel like if you can write, as a black woman, if yeah. you can write uh, the story of a trans Asian person okay. and do it so well that people in that community are like, oh, nice job. Right. Then, then I think you have achieved a, a great exercise of empathy. You've done it with love. You haven't done it because like, oh, this is popular, so I'm going to write this. Right. You're, you're doing it out of a love for the subject because to do it so well, you, ha you have to love it. You I think so. And the problem is, the asterisk is, if you don't do it well, there's a price to pay. <laughs> but I think, yeah. I think the answer is do it well. And, and when someone does it well, Embrace it? Embrace them. That, that, right. that they're very empathetic, well-researched, understanding human being. Right. And it helps us to understand each other. Because once we sort of tribe off and then sub-tribe and sub-tribe, I, I think we're, on the aggregate, we're losing something. Um, and I, I, granted, there are some uh, people who are so marginalized and there are so few voices in that community, mm -hmm. Native American community specifically, yes. that I think white people writing books about the Native American experience as a novel, I think their time is, is better spent encouraging and finding the next great 10, 20 Native American voices right. to support by I buying certainly. books, by um, going to events by those authors. Right. There, I just, there are some categories that are so neglected in our culture that I probably, if you that that's the asterisk. I think. Okay. I think there are better ways you can help that community okay. than um, falling in love and trying to uh, replicate it. And, and there, there was there was a famous poet who mm -hmm. uh, he was. I don't think he was Native American, mm -hmm. but wrote with a Native American like pen name. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I don't do that. That's bad. Yeah. Thing. No. Yeah. No. No. That that's definitely appropriation yeah. at that point. Yeah. Well. This is a good note to end on, I think. <laughs> uh, it's so. certainly a note to yeah. give our, our watchers something to think about. Um, and uh, man, I'm so excited that you're here. Thanks and thank you me. for talking to me. It's a um, pleasure. Wow. Yeah. This has been great. And um, thank you for watching us. And thanks for um, being here with us at Writer's Den. <laughs>